Well, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. And for those of you who are just tuning in on our web stream, I am Keith Huxon, the Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Director of Research and History here at the National World War II Museum. As Dr. Mueller's remarks referenced earlier, World War II required a total effort on the parts of all belligerents. And we just heard an excellent presentation on how the Allies and their strategic planning was putting the war effort on the road to victory in 1943. But we know that while 1943 loosely marks the historical halfway point of the war, there was no way for people in combat or at home to know this in the moment. We will now hear how two of the big three allies helped win the war on their respective home fronts. First, we will hear from Dr. Roger Lachin about the American home front, which in 1943 was engaged in spurring our industrial arsenal of democracy to ever greater soaring heights. Dr. Lachin received both his MA and his PhD from the University of Chicago. As an urban and Western historian, his writings have focused on various California cities in the 19th and 20th centuries. He has studied the impact of the war on the American home front, which is why he has come down to New Orleans from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he is a professor. We will then hear from Dr. Raina Pennington, who teaches military history at Norwich University. Dr. Pennington is an Air Force veteran. She is a board member of the Society of Military History and sits on the museum's Presidential Counselor's Advisory Board. She holds degrees in Soviet studies and women's studies, and her first book, Wings, Women, and War, Soviet Air Women in World War II, combined both those fields. She is currently working on a book, What Russia Can Teach Us About War. So, for this year's conference, she has shifted her focus a bit to discuss an overlooked subject, the Russian home front. But first, please join me in welcoming Dr. Roger Lachin. Sorry about these, these are just a little bit too small. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you for that introduction and thanking the uh, National World War II Museum for inviting me to this wonderful occasion at this very extraordinary venue. But I, before I talk about the war, I would like to correct one misconception that uh, was thrown out by an earlier uh, speaker. That is that the University of Wisconsin had the finest <laughs> history department. <laughs> he obviously misspoke. He meant to say the University of Chicago. <laughs> I've entitled my talk the home front urban paradox of World War II. When I sat down to construct this talk, I was somewhat intimidated because of the vast and complex nature of the subject. So to help clear and focus my mind, I thought that some time with the World Series might be appropriate. Operating on the well-known Clausewitzian principle, that war is a continuation of sports using different means. <laughs> the series clarified things considerably and led me to conclude that I should talk about my own core beliefs about the relationship of American urbanism and war. Although the United States was a nation of cities and towns in 1941, there is not much of a literature on the role of cities in the Second World War. Cities were the context from which the home front war was fought, but other matters have claimed more attention. Historians have written excellent volumes on the way in which industry mobilized, on how the farmers extracted miracles from the land, 
on how war affected the economic cycles, on the wonders of shipbuilding, and the supposed military-industrial complex, and on the impact of war on the nation state. And historians have been very interested in whether the conflict was a good war for women, blacks, Chicanos, gays, labor, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, and other ethnics. And historians have creatively dramatized the many contributions of these social groups to victory, mostly to the labor force. The good war term was coined by Studs Terkel, the famous oral historian, but the idea was longstanding before he put a name to it. Yet the city's role in all of this has generally ranged from negative to non-existent. Commentators generally have not asked if cities were good for war and vice versa. Since wars and urbanism have been two of the most enduring continuities in Western civilization since 1815 and probably going back at least to 1600, their relationship seems important. Going back at least to Thomas Jefferson, Americans have bemoaned the presence of cities. We don't know if this is a majority view or a minority one, but lots of people held it. Some feared mobs or muggers or moral decay or pestilence or other religions or revolution or political corruption or what have you. An 18th century poet captured the gist of this plaint when he said that cities were places where wealth accumulates and men decay. One of Thomas Jefferson's correspondents likened cities to abscesses on the human bodies, repositories of all the ills of society. And modern city planners, environmentalists, and Marxists have their own versions. I might just add parenthetically that that was what was believed in my little Shelbyville Illinois hometown in Illinois when I was growing up. The young blades in town always wanted to go to Chicago to get drunk and disorderly, to go to the burlesque shows, and to create world-class hangovers that they didn't know oxygen cured at that point in time, and come back with all kinds of fantastic stories about fisticuffs and flirtations. <clears throat> but the critics usually do not think about the role of cities at war. So to deal with the last question, one can say that 20th century American cities are usually good for wars, and yet wars are not good for cities. Therein lies the paradox or contradiction, if you will. A noted American sociologist named Robert Merton once posed the theory that big city political machines had latent functions, not visible to the naked eye, which advanced the welfare of both business and minorities. Whether he was right about machine politics is entirely debatable, but if the theory is applied to cities at war, it is quite correct. On any given day, cities have excess capacities. The, street, the streetcars and buses run half empty. The Rose Bowls and Soldier Fields only see crowds on weekend. Streets are crowded at rush hour, but underused most of the day except for parking. Both public and private schools are occupied only during school hours. Large tracts of land are not occupied at all. Parks are seldom mobbed. Cities had latent military resources because there was a lot of slack in the system. Since our cities were not bombed or shelled, they were not military liabilities in World War II, so we can concentrate on their latent resources. One was an educational system. In World War II, schools provided babysitting services of two or three kinds, freeing up women to join the labor force. They also provided classes and classrooms for everyone from draftsmen to welders to metal workers. 
They supplied sports venues for tired or bored war workers, whether stadiums or high school gyms. And they were meeting places for civil defense, for draft boards, for rationing boards, and much else. And teachers who knew the neighborhoods were ideal rationing administrators. Before the war, schools ran mostly nine to three. After Pearl Harbor, they ran well into the night. In Chicago, they ran 24-7. And city recreation departments offered thousands of programs to servicemen. Every city had some kind of a modern water supply, and these two came in handy for a nation state at war. In the American West, San Francisco, Phoenix, and LA had pioneered in creating water systems, and the East, Philadelphia, and New York City had. Almost everywhere, these systems were public, and they created tremendous amounts of developed water. In Southern California, Los Angeles led the urban area in creating and financing the Southern California Metropolitan Water District, which brought water from the Colorado River to the parched Southland. And as you know, Southland is their term for Southern California, so it's not your Southland. <laughs> and the nation state at war had many needs for water. When the government wanted an arid ecology in which to train soldiers for campaigns in North Africa, they chose a site east of LA because it was adjacent to a water supply from the Colorado Aqueduct. Under the tutelage of George Patton, the site became the Desert Training Center, the largest military installation in the world, which trained over a million men. Los Angeles also attracted 400,000 civilians during the war, plus hundreds of thousands of military men for its many bases. The city and the MWD supplied water for bases, headquarters, factories, hospitals, and much else. This pattern happened all across America. We haven't much noticed it, but bases were instant cities, like Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where the 101st Airborne used to be. Fort Campbell had 75,000 people in World War II. They were instant cities that had to have water. Not the least contribution of this Los Angeles finance project was to keep the huge San Diego Navy complex in the war by providing water there when their local system became overextended. LA became an artificial rubber producing area in large part because that process required huge amounts of water. Rubber was rationed in large measure because of the Japanese conquest of our former supply of natural rubber in the Dutch East Indies. Helping overcome that rubber deficit was not the least of LA's contributions. And although gasoline was rationed largely because of a rubber shortage, LA's water supply nurtured that water intensive manufacturing process too, and the Pacific fighting fronts had plenty of uses for it. Since water <coughs> from part of the LA system flowed downhill from the mountains, it also provided electricity, another crucial resource for the nation state's war. The same was true of San Francisco and other places, although most cities had private electricity. Without developed water, the government could not have waged war from these hydro-deficient desert sites, which includes about half of the United States, nor indeed from eastern or midwestern ones either. These complex hydraulic works could not simply be improvised overnight. Cities also supplied huge labor pools for the hungry factories. These were women, high school boys, African Americans, other ethnics, white male retirees, and the handicapped. Women alone increased their share of the workforce from 27% to 37% during the struggle against fascism. And all of these resident workers, especially married women, were qualitatively superior to migrants from the countryside or small towns. They were better educated. They already had their kids in schools. They had housing. And they did not have to burn up precious rubber and gasoline 
to migrate from the deep south or midwest to the employment centers. When females were not welding and riveting ships and planes, they joined the Women's Land Army to help farmers create their own miracles of production. San Francisco even emptied its jails into the workforce, and others soon followed suit. Federal prisons didn't liberate their inmates, but certainly turned them loose on major war work. For example, the federal prisons did the laundry of all the many Bay Area military installations. We don't know if Alcatraz resident and public enemy number one, Al Capone, scrubbed the sailor's socks, but his fellow prisoners washed them by the boat load. And prisons manufactured everything, from ration books to submarine nets which protected the harbor to Navy furniture to landing craft. City workers often did not need individual automobiles to commute. They could carpool, they could bike, they could walk, they could ride the trolleys. All over America, these endless lines of battered streetcars and buses hauled billions of passengers to the sites where the miracles of production occurred. Even in auto-dependent Los Angeles, transit carried a million a day. Chicago transit carried everyone, from servicemen exploring the city to neighborhood women hauling pies and cakes to the downtown USOs. The war effort required endless logistical tasks, and huge investments in infrastructure allowed this part of the war effort to advance. Public roads, sewers, overpasses, culverts, tunnels, and bridges absolved the government from building these works, which it could not have done without and which it could not build in time. The Golden Gate Bridge was perhaps the most famous, but the Triborough Bridge in New York City, built on commuters' nickel tolls, was more significant. Pittsburgh was literally ribbed with bridges, and many other places were too. One of the greatest urban transportation assets to fall into military hands <clears throat> excuse me, were the harbors. In major ports like San Francisco, Oakland, and New York, these contained thousands of docks, many of them publicly owned and operated by port authorities. And all of the harbors had extensive man-made onshore works. Ports had highways in and out of town, streets everywhere, alleys, causeways, and acres of artificial land which could be turned into military uses. And though businessmen deserve the most credit for the industrial miracles of production, cities deserve some too. Cities are preeminently places where specialization thrives, whether in music, medicine, or manufacture. Specialization, in turn, promoted subcontracting, which permitted the government to spread geographically the war prosperity around and thus solidify political support for the conflict. Therefore, small business benefited, and large aircraft firms like Douglas and Studebaker were attracted to Chicago because of the vast range of skills in its specialized workforce, its masses of subcontractors, and its specialized manufacturing firms. Now, I know you're going to remind me that Studebaker makes trucks and cars. In World War II, they also made airplanes. So uh, that's the explanation of that counterintuitive statement. Two historians sum this up very well. Quote, in other words, the subdivision of production worked well in a big city. And beyond that, the subdivision of contracts worked well in the political system. So did the city's converging road and rail networks. An astounding amount of freight and people had to be exchanged over New York City spaces alone, to and from its many bases, from one pier to another, or to departing ships. Chicago's investment in infrastructure actually changed the direction of the Chicago River which allowed the manufacture of submarines and subchasers in places like Manitowoc, Wisconsin, because they could be shipped by water to New Orleans. Subchasers and landing craft are also produced in Chicago. 
And below every surface city was also an underground one for subways, telephone and electrical systems, sanitary and storm sewers. If the industrialists and farmers created miracles of production, and nobody disputes that, someone else had to create marvels of management at the urban destination points. Unlike World War I, they did. Airports were more a joint venture for the nation state, but they were conceived and operated by cities before the war. <clears throat> After Pearl Harbor, airlines mostly carried service personnel on long hauls with short timelines. Larger airports such as Chicago, San Diego, Montgomery, and Charlotte served as manufacturing, repair, training, and testing sites as well. Even the smaller sky harbors, as they were called at the time, became important pilot training centers and at the very least storage parks for planes going overseas. Urban housing made a similar contribution. Historians usually bemoan the shortage of wartime public housing, but private housing somehow or other made up the difference. Some opened up by migration, some by servicemen leaving home, and some by conversion. Cities became immense defense dormitories. Louisville, for example, its surplus housing allowed the construction of a government plan to build the world's largest smokeless powder factory, employing 26,000 workers in the huge metropolis of Charlestown, Indiana, population 900. People living in chicken coops, tents, and parked cars have sometimes fascinated historians, but most workers lived somewhere else. Parks gave everyone air to breathe and space for tent housing early on. And every city had a dense network of social institutions, ranging from chambers of commerce, American Legion, Kiwanis, YMCA, YWCA, YMHA, Knights of Columbus, youth organizations, churches, unions, taverns, and more. These served as communication and mobilization nodes for the nation state. And city spaces like the LA Coliseum, parks, squares, streets, even the Chicago River served for bond and scrap drives, military parade grounds, honorary pageants, and sham battles to bolster faltering morale at the beginning and end of the war. Cities and towns turned these spaces to good account to collect funds and scrap. The book Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which I'm sure you've all read, or maybe two or three times, reminds us that cities are world-class junk heaps. The government used both junk and bonds enough to build U.S. Navy carriers for Chicago and L.A. and other places as well. Cities and towns which could not afford a ship bought a plane, like some L.A. suburbs and Charlotte, and even tiny Whiteville, North Carolina. And this list does not even include hospitals, doctors, medical education, and lots else. After major military battles, big city hospitals were brimming with stretchers in the halls and 24-7 in the OR. Perhaps the migration figures for the war sum up the home front achievement best. If 31 million people migrated to somewhere else, that means that nearly 25% of the total population had to be fed, housed, transported, reorganized, clothed, and entertained somewhere else from their starting points in less than two years. Small towns and rural areas lack most of these advantages. Country schools usually went only through eighth grade and often with everybody in one room, and they let out early and started late to accommodate the agricultural calendar. Those who wanted high school had to walk to town or board there. Towns had inferior schools, inadequate housing, no public transportation, and many unpaved streets even in Illinois where I grew up, which was a prosperous state. States like Alabama, Florida,
Texas and Louisiana had woeful lacks. The government had to shoehorn bases, port construction, or shipbuilding into southern shock cities and towns like Wilmington, Mobile, Corpus Christi, Pascagoula, Panama City, Florida, and Orange, Texas. There it had to create all of these services anew, water, schools, housing, docks, policemen, firemen, hospitals, disposal, infrastructure, what have you. In the Southern American countryside, housewives were often prevented from joining the wartime industrial miracles because rubber and gasoline shortages kept them from getting to town. We should not detract from the titans of industry like Henry Kaiser, Bill Knudsen, and Donald Douglas. And with the writing of Lizzie Collingham, we now know there was a production miracle on the farm front as well, but the cities gave these industrialists and farmers an accommodating place to work their wonders. If the United States as a whole had been as under-urbanized as the South, it would have been much harder to do this. Despite the suffering of the Japanese Americans, the shared experience of urban life also warmed the melting pot. So did the experience of war. People got used to extraordinary geographic mobility, the novelty of female wage labor, blacks working to, next to you on a machine, the new knowledge of exotic places, the condition of living for the moment, the long goodbyes, and the dread of the telegram, quote unquote, which would bring a gold star. All of this created a shared history that had not been there before, especially from newer, for newer ethnics who didn't get to this country in the 18th century. As the experience of the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires indicate, successful nations need something that causes them to cohere, to hold together. Both those empires were torn apart because they lacked a dominant nationality, a shared history, and an agreed upon set of principles and therefore lacked coherence. Historians have not always appreciated the melting pot nor even recognized it, but a nation state at war needed badly to cohere and the urban melting pot helped them do so. So did their urban music. Whenever Americans could, they danced and listened to swing, the new music of the 40s. And disparate white ethnics played it together. How much they, however much they might not have got along, otherwise they were on the same bandstands. But the venues themselves were usually not racially integrated. Still, the sounds were integrated, even if the bandstands were not. Swing, as you probably all know, as an African-American creation and its mass acceptance by whites was perhaps the most remarkable thing about it. The noted music historian Harry Kamen explained that music in New Orleans was the first meeting ground for the nationalities. And he might have added for much of the rest of America too. And somehow, amazingly, Mysteriously, improbably, Americans met, mingled, and cohered. We have long and indecisively debated what is exceptional about this country. Well, my answer is that the melting pot is exceptional. Few other places shared that condition in 1941. The melting pot idea that we can all dissolve into one nationality is an American conceit. It is one that this speaker devoutly believes in, but it is a conceit nonetheless. Certainly Europeans did not believe it. When Hitler pursued his Machiavellian policy of destroying Austria and Czechoslovakia, nationalist groups contiguous to, contiguous to these benighted countries helped him every step of the way. While the war was tearing other nations apart, it was pulling Americans together. I would not like to leave the impression that there were no losers in this war. American cities certainly did not suffer anything like Russian, English, or German ones, but they took a tremendous beating nonetheless. 
Almost all of the serious problems that have plagued American cities since 1945 are traceable to the Second World War. And I won't list those, but take my word for it. These heavy war impacts were never fully compensated by the national government. Small towns suffered less, but still somewhat. So it was not a good war for cities. Perhaps the Marines at Peleliu provide the proper metaphor. Cities took terrific casualties, but nonetheless helped win the battle. Thank you. So I have 20 minutes to try to sum up for you the home front of the largest country in the world and the biggest war that ever was. I hope you understand that means this is going to be a mile wide and an inch deep, but maybe it will inspire you to do a little bit more uh, reading on this if, it, if this is a topic that, that interests you. I think that the story of how the Soviet Union absorbed the largest invasion in history and still mobilized soldiers and workers and produced weapons on a par with the United States uh, is an astonishing one. There were many similarities between the United States and the Soviet Union in the Second World War. Both were large countries in size and population with a strong industrial base. Both had been attacked without provocation and uh, faced years of war against ruthless and relentless enemies. Both responded with mass mobilization and enormous industrial output and of course both emerged as victors and eventually as superpowers. But I would suggest that the similarities don't go as far as we might think. The Soviet Union was invaded and occupied while the United States was not. By the end of 1941, about a third of the Soviet population was living under German occupation. That catastrophic loss, I think, is rarely remembered in the West, where the assumption persists that the Soviet Union mustered soldiers and workers from a vast population. The Soviet population in 1939 was around 190 million, after the German invasion, that was reduced to 110 million in the unoccupied areas. Uh, by contrast, the US at that time had a population of 130 million. So for much of the war, the Soviets were actually fighting from a lower population base than what the United States had at the same time. In addition, of course, the Soviet Union suffered almost incomprehensible casualties, the most military casualties and the most civilian casualties of any country in the war at least 25 million Soviet citizens died. That's a conservative estimate. Some people say it's as high as 50. That's one out of every seven people in the Soviet Union who died in the war. For every American who died in the war, 85 Soviet citizens died. So the impact is dramatically different. And when you talk about the home front, in the West we have sometimes a kind of nostalgic feeling. We talk about the good war. We talk about Mrs. Miniver. I don't think that that kind of nostalgia applies to the Soviet experience. The Soviet Union was also the only major power that had to wage total war on its own territory. And it did so after having already lost a large portion of that territory and of its population to the enemy occupation. So it's impossible to study the experience of the Soviet Union in World War II without being amazed and appalled, and especially, I think, when studying the home front. I would even argue that the capacity of the Soviet home front to sustain the war effort could be the, most, the single most important factor in the defeat of Nazi Germany. Without the home front, there would have been no Red Army. And without the Red Army, the Wehrmacht uh, would not have suffered 80% of its casualties on the Eastern Front. There would have been another 9 million German soldiers to be used in the West. After 18 months of horrific defeat, by 1943, the Soviets rose from the ashes and, against all odds, defeated Nazi Germany. They did it by mobilizing a far greater percentage of their people than any other society in the war, under worse conditions and truly demonstrating what it means to do more with less, much less. So today I want to talk about a couple of key aspects of that home front, industry, agriculture, food, and the role of women. During the war, the Soviet Union uh, endured terrible reversals in its industrial sector, some that were suffered by no other nation. 
again, due to the loss of key territories to German occupation. One of the incredible things that they did was to relocate hundreds and hundreds of factories in advance of the German occupation. So in 1941, more than 1,500 large-scale enterprises, including at least 100 aircraft factories, were moved from western areas of the Soviet Union to the east. About half went to the Ural Mountains and the rest to the Volga, uh, to Central Asia, and to Siberia. Then the factories were set back up, often in the most primitive conditions that you can imagine, and put back into production. The workers, at least half of whom were women, lived in tents or holes in the ground, summer and winter, until the end of the war. In addition to that, some 3,500 new factories were built during the war, but conditions there were no better than they were at the relocated factories. Work hours were long and arduous. During the first week of the war, holidays and vacations were abolished, and compulsory overtime up to three hours a day was introduced. That brought the typical work week from 48 hours to 55 hours, and uh, six days a week was the usual number for uh, people in the Soviet Union, although many people worked seven days a week uh, for weeks on end, volunteering their overtime. Now, at the same time, the Soviet Union had lost access to critical energy sources and to raw materials as well as to workers. By 1942, the unoccupied Soviet Union had to operate on only half the electricity, 40% of the steel, and one-third of the coal that it had used before the war started. The Soviet working population was cut from 85 million to 53 million. And from that base, it had to mobilize about 12 or 13 million soldiers into the Red Army in the first year, uh, as well as providing workers for industry and agriculture. So the end result was actually a net loss of industrial and agricultural workers during the war. The number of people employed in industry dropped from 31 million in 1940 to fewer than 19 million in 1942. That's 41%, a 41% drop and it didn't recover until after the war. So not only were Soviet factories understaffed, the workers were underfed. They worked 12 hours a day at most plants on half the calories of American workers, and they still produced twice as many tanks as the Germans and 30% more aircraft. Uh, and they did it with only a quarter of the steel that was available to Germany. The Soviets simply were more efficient than the Germans in their production. Despite those obstacles, Soviet industry uh, in munitions quadrupled its output during the war. By 1944, the Soviets were producing 3,400 aircraft, 1,800 armored vehicles, 200,000 rifles, and 19 million shells, mines, and bombs every month. The Soviets outproduced not just Germany, but also the United States in tanks and artillery, partly because they didn't produce many warships, jeeps, or military trucks. They focused on key weapon systems, and by the end of the war, artillery was one-sixth of the Red Army. But there was still a huge economic differential between the superpowers. The Soviet economy would be the second largest in the world by the end of World War II, but it was still only one quarter that of the United States. Far from having endless resources at its disposal, the Soviet state had to outproduce its enemy with far fewer resources and workers than were available in the United States. Well, agriculture was in even worse shape than industry. Soviet agriculture was in a wretched state of disrepair before the war even started. During collectivization in the 1930s, crops and livestock declined precipitously, and millions of people died of starvation. There was rationing until 1936. Agriculture remained in desperate straits throughout the war. The Wehrmacht quickly controlled nearly half of the cropland and half or more of all key livestock and almost all of the sugar production that the Soviet Union had. Mobilization for the army struck another blow to agriculture as more than half of all men who were still working on farms were called up. The number of able-bodied men on farms fell from 17 million in 1941 to only 4.4 million in 1945. Well, that left the young, the old, and the women to work the farms. During planting and harvesting, they brought in people from the cities to help out, but again, this was women, children, and the elderly. Those are the people who fed the Soviet Union during the war. Because both skilled drivers and most of the heavy equipment had also been taken by the Red Army, in 1942, 79% of all sowing and harvesting was done by hand. Uh, women were literally pulling plows because there were no tractors in the fields left. So as you can imagine, agricultural output fell drastically during the war. 
1940, the Soviet Union had harvested more than 95 million tons of grain. In 1942, it was down to 27 million. In the year that they fought the Battle of Stalingrad, the Soviet people were fighting with a quarter of the grain, one third of the meat, one third of the potatoes, and 10% of the sugar that they had had only two years before. Life on collective farms was truly miserable during the war. Farm workers did not receive rations. They were expected to provide their own food, despite the fact that production was generally diminished and the state requisitioned most of what was grown. One solution was the expansion of private plots. The number of those tripled between 1942 and 44. Even the army got involved in that. It set up some 5,000 farms of its own, largely trying to produce more protein for the soldiers, focusing on livestock, fish, uh, and eggs. So there was a campaign to encourage people to grow anything they could, anywhere they could. But where Victory Gardens in the United States were a supplement to people's diet, in the Soviet Union, they could literally mean the difference between life and death. To summarize, as Lily, Lizzie Collingham put it in her book, and, and my colleague mentioned that, uh, Soviet industry teetered on the brink of collapse in 1941 and 42, but eventually adapted and found inventive ways of overcoming its problems. Agriculture, however, went to the brink of collapse and stayed there. Well, the result of all that can be seen in the food situation, which was already pretty bad before the war. Uh, for example, in 1900, people in Russia got five times as much meat and fish as they were getting 30 years later after collectivization. So the food crisis can hardly be overstated. If workers got everything on their ration cards, which didn't happen very often, that still only totaled half the calories that American workers were getting on the home front. In general, cities were better off than the countryside, but it's still been said that by the winter of 1941, every dog, cat, and crow in Moscow had been caught and eaten. People cooked their food in Vaseline and paraffin because oils were in such short supply. Hunger caused an increase in crime during the war with desperate people stealing from storehouses and fields. Uh, an American naval officer reported that when his convoy delivered land-lease shipments to Arkhangelsk, crowds of starving people descended on the garbage that was being taken off the ships, eating handfuls of raw meat scraps and chicken guts that were in the galley scraps. By the end of the war, the average Soviet citizen, those that didn't starve to death, had lost 20 to 70 pounds. The army got higher rations than civilians. Many recruits said that one good thing about going in the army was now they got two or three meals a day instead of just one. So the army got priority, but that's not really saying very much. With more than 12 million soldiers to feed and agriculture in such dire straits, rations were still barely above starvation level. Soldiers got less than 3,000 calories a day. Uh, by comparison, British Army rations, not known for being lavish, amounted to more than 5,000 calories. Typical meals for the Red Army up until 1943 were porridge for breakfast, soup for lunch, and bread and pickles for dinner. When they were lucky, troops got dried fish or potatoes. Well, Napoleon is supposed to have said that an army marches on its stomach. Until late 1943, the Red Army was literally fighting on empty. 1943 marked the liberation of parts of the Ukraine. In fact, today is the 70th anniversary of when the Soviet army was free in Kiev. Uh, but that actually made matters worse for a time. German scorched earth policies had devastated those territories. Uh, and when they left behind, uh, they'd already stripped the areas of crops and livestock. Recovery of those occupied areas just meant more mouths to feed for the Soviet government without any immediate increase uh, in cropland. Well, that's, of course, what made Lend-Lease so important. Stalin pressed hard for food and raw materials rather than for weapons. And what every Soviet citizen remembers is the food. Every veteran I've interviewed when you ask about Lend-Lease remembers powdered eggs and Spam. Spam, the joke was, when you open a can of Spam, that was the opening of the Second Front because, in their opinion, that's as far as the United States was getting at this point. But Lendley started pretty slowly. During the first two years of the war, the United States sent three times as much food to Britain as it did to the Soviet Union, which had five times as many people. In 1943, Lendley's deliveries increased, but most of it went to the army and not civilians. So between 42 and 44, Soviet rations for civilians only went up by 300 calories a day. That's one potato. In short, 
The Soviets survived on far less food than any other combatant nation except uh, the Japanese. Women's participation in industry and in the military was one of the unique things about the Soviet Union. It far exceeded that of any other culture in history. The Soviet Union is the only major power in history that has allowed women to fight as combat troops in significant numbers. And there were at least 800,000 women in the Red Army. They engaged in combat in all branches of service and in all kinds of support roles. The Soviet Union was the first to allow women to fly in combat. And unique also in being the only army uh, in which female soldiers fought outside the boundaries of their own country as they were advancing into Germany and East Europe. But it wasn't just the use of women in the military that made the Soviet Union exceptional. Before the war, women had already been integrated into the industrial force as well. So unlike the West, there was no culture shock at seeing women in these supposedly masculine occupations. There was no Rosie the Riveter phenomenon in Russia. Equal pay for equal work was already the rule, and that continued throughout the war, both in the military and in industry. Women volunteered for war work, and there were also labor mobilizations. In 1941, half a million previously unemployed women volunteered, as well as 300,000 children aged 12 to 15. Another half a million workers came from those same groups in 1942. Uh, but even so, the actual number of women in industry dropped in 1942 to 44, again, largely because of people in the occupied areas. So in 1940, there were four and a half million women in Soviet industry. In 1945, the number was barely higher, 4.8 million. The percentages of women did go up, again, because of men being recruited to the Red Army uh, and lost in the occupied areas. So the percentage of women workers rose from 41% to 51% by the end of the war. And in certain fields, it went up more. In transportation, it went up from 21 to 40%. Women uh, were more than half of all turbine operators and power stations. During the war, they became one quarter of all the workers in coal mines. And by the end of the war, 92% of all agricultural workers were women. As an industry, although the percentage of women involved in agriculture rose, the absolute numbers dropped. It went from 18.6 million in 1941 to only 10.1 million in 1942 and didn't recover until the end of the war. So again, throughout the war in all sectors, the Soviets are operating with fewer people in industry and agriculture than they had had before the war. Raisa Gorbachev once said, our women know the price of war and peace. Women's lives were transformed in most countries during the war, but I think it's fair to say that in the Soviet Union, those changes reached farther and deeper than in any other country. I want to say just a couple of words about the occupied areas, because another unique thing about the Soviet home front is that you have these two areas, both the occupied and unoccupied territories. And remember that occupied areas are fought over at least twice during the invasion and then during the liberation. Some changed hands many times during the course of the war, and all of that had devastating consequences for the civilians in those regions. 80 or 90 million Soviet citizens found themselves under German occupation. And the treatment of those people by German forces is one of the great tragedies of history. These people were intentionally starved in what was called the Hunger Plan. Before the invasion of Russia, this plan stated that, quote, the war can only be continued if the entire Wehrmacht is fed from Russia in the third year of the war. And if we take what we need out of the country, there can be no doubt that tens of millions of people will die of starvation. So this was part of the German plan. It was recognized what the effects of this policy would be, and it was the policy they implemented in the occupied areas. Uh, later elaborations of the plan stated, many tens of millions of people in this country will become super superfluous and will die or must immigrate to Siberia. Uh, then, of course, you had cases like Leningrad, the besieged city of Leningrad, where nearly a million people died, more than the combined wartime deaths for the United States and Britain, and again, most from starvation. Uh, the hunger plan extended to Soviet POWs. More than three million died during the war, again, primarily from starvation. 25 million Soviet people became homeless during the war. Many families were separated, and uh, hundreds of thousands of war orphans were created in that process. Deportations also took a toll. 
Nearly two and a half million people were deported from Ukraine alone to act as forced labor in Germany and other places, about five million in all from Soviet territory. And again, that was a, a brutal human traffic that ripped families apart. The Germans literally worked many of those people to death. In 1943, Himmler made a speech to SS group leaders saying, whether or not 10,000 Russian women collapsed from exhaustion while digging a tank ditch interests me only so far as the tank ditch is completed for Germany. Jews in Russia, of course, were subjected to special treatment. During the first year of the war, 1.5 million Jews died at the hands of the SS, the Wehrmacht, and local volunteers. Most were simply shot. Another million were killed by other means, a total of 2.6 million out of the 5 million Jews in Russia. Of Soviet Jews who fell under German control, less than 2% survived the war. So life in the occupied areas was one of the most brutal experiences imaginable. Uh, but even in the unoccupied areas, life was far from easy. There was a spirit of sacrifice and immense patriotism on the Soviet home front. But the cost for the Soviet citizens is almost inconceivable. Daily life for civilians on the home front was one of nagging hunger and grinding drudgery. Daily life was a perpetual misery. Wartime production was achieved at great cost. And it did not produce the post-war boom that we saw in the West. It took years for the damaged infrastructure to recover. Uh, for example, when the war ended in Moscow, 90% of central heating was out of commission. Almost half of their water and sewage systems. And many uh, other areas needed similar attention. Rationing continued for years. There was no economic miracle in the Soviet Union, which even West Germany and Japan saw uh, after the war ended. Uh, historian Gregory Smith has said, people in the Soviet Union were left reeling after four years of relentless hardship and sacrifice. The sorrow of millions was the most profound legacy of all. Thank you. duty here and moderate this panel uh, as well as MC today and I found this a very interesting topic on both sides. Thank you doctors Lachin and Pennington for giving us insight into how two societies organized upon completely different philosophical systems dealt with organized responded to the demands of wartime. And they had some common interests, I'll point out. The United States and the Soviet Union, after all, were fighting a common enemy. But listening to your presentations, I think the thing that you brought out most clearly is that although there are some uh, uh, parallel experiences, common enemy, as well as great social change being unleashed at home, uh, what really stands out about this is the impact of the war itself. Uh, I think that you have two very different experiences in the United States. We talk about a wartime economic miracle. Our economy goes from about $100 billion GDP in 1939 to over $240 billion by 1945. It is industrial expansion versus urban destruction, of course. And the statistics that, you know, we've heard here, we, the United States, lost 400,000 in the war with a population base of 130 million. The Soviet Union had a population base of about 170 million, 27 million dead, not to mention the after, effect, after effects on broken families is just uh, uh, two very separate experiences. And it really made an impact with me. I had been in Russia back in August, standing in a place like Mameyev Kurgan the uh, monument at Stalingrad and realizing that you've got 35,000 pieces of bodies buried under that hill. It's a mass grave. You go to St. Petersburg, Siege of Leningrad during the war, visit a cemetery where there are 500,000 people buried, mass graves in that cemetery, and you'll see in the cemetery a little museum set up 
where you'll see a piece of bread, 125 calories of bread that's mostly made out of sawdust. So those things are very real and something to think about in your presentations. And so I'd now like to open up the floor to questions from the audience for Dr. Lachin and Dr. Pennington. We have a question here on the left side. I'd like to ask uh, one question of each of the speakers, if I may, Dr. Lachin. Would you comment on the long-term impact of the movement of women out of the home on American society, very briefly? And secondly, Dr. Pennington, would you comment on the impact or whether there have been any studies of the impact of a totalitarian regime fighting the war in the Soviet Union as opposed to, another, say, another form of perhaps a more democratic government? Well, uh, I follow pretty closely Claudia Golden's work, I mean, in the sense that I accept her work on how much of a difference it made uh, for women coming out of the home. I think a lot of them went to work during the war. Then there was a decline, and then it built back slowly to about 1950, and from that time on, it seems to me that, that more and more women uh, went into the workforce. I know her findings aren't universally accepted, but sh she's a very competent admin uh, investigator and a very careful one, so uh, she's got my vote. About the totalitarian regime in Russia, the, an interesting political effect of the war was that it actually legitimized Stalin's government. Even though Stalin killed more of his own people than Hitler did, most of Stalin's crimes were hidden from the general public. They were localized. They were in Ukraine during collectivization, or they were in the Gulag. And many people never realized the extent of the deaths under Stalin. On the other hand, they knew that Stalin had made the country stronger that without some of Stalin's policies, it probably could not have survived World War II. So most people felt that the Soviet government had redeemed itself. It gave it new life uh, for quite a while after the war. Question on the right. Um, Dr. Stoller earlier today mentioned Stalin's fury at uh, the uh, British and the Americans when they uh, went back on what he felt was a commitment on the second front in 1942 and 1943. And I'm just wondering if that had any resonance uh, with the uh, population in uh, the Soviet Union and whether that made any difference. Um, I just would note that at the time, uh, there had been a communique put out by all three nations in the spring, which pretty, uh, 1942, which um, suggested strongly that w there would be a second front. And the, um, both the ambassadors of uh, the United States and Britain in Moscow, or I guess it was Kubyashev at the time, because um, they'd moved the embassies temporarily. Um, uh, wrote back to their government saying uh, if uh, that the, the propaganda in the Soviet Union had reached a fever pitch uh, as far as uh, the second front issue is concerned. And they were very concerned that if uh, there wasn't any plan to actually carry it out in 1942, that this would have um, you know, very serious consequences. Soviet citizens were very aware of the fact that they were bearing the brunt of uh, fighting Nazi Germany. And with or without the propaganda, many, many people have commented in letters and diaries their desire for someone to open up a second front. Um, they felt resentful towards the West for not doing so. There's a fascinating book, which is the memoir of a Soviet surgeon during the war, later came to the United States and became a famed cardiologist. And he talks about during the war, if only Americans could see what he saw in that hospital every day, that they wouldn't drag their heels on opening the second front. Uh, so I think that was a, a common uh, feeling among the Soviet people. We have a question right here in the front. Uh, Dr. Pennington, uh, I would wonder, have the Soviet women 
kept the gains that they made as far as uh, the same pay and, and the same respect and so forth since the war that they did during the war? No. So it's sort of regress, it's, it's regressed like it has here. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting phenomenon, and you can trace that in virtually every country where women, whatever gains they made during the war, were retracted after the war. Israel, Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, many other places. Part of that is the desire to return to normalcy, to get back to what they thought the culture was that they were fighting for before the war. Um, part of it, in the case of the Soviet Union, is the, the precipitous decline in population, and so they wanted women in more traditional roles for that. Question a little further back. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Pennington. You mentioned uh, in terms of the food and starvation in the Soviet Union that um, people were generally better off, civilians were generally better off in the cities. Uh, it struck me as slightly counterintuitive, and I wondered, is that a matter of logistics, uh, superior delivery systems, or what? Yeah, I, I can't see where the question's coming from because of the, the lights. Uh, yeah, it, it's ironic, but the, the collection system was so efficient at taking food away from the farms, which had been collectivized, that they could take most of the food from the country, and they, they prioritized the army and the factories. And they just left the farmers to practically fend for themselves. So, you know, that is a, a contradiction. That goes back. Actually, I'll just add this, that uh, Dr. Pennington had referred to the uh, collectivization efforts of the early 1930s, and uh, there is documentation on the Soviet grain harvest, particularly in the Ukraine, where they were so efficient that they went from better than 23 million poods is the, is the unit of measurement for Russian grain back then. Within four years, it was at a negative balance. They were literally just taking everything out of the countryside. So that system had been perfected at least a, de a decade before. This question, is, this question is for Dr. Pennington. Um, Ma'am, I wouldn't wonder if you'd be kind enough to answer, in, in your opinion, you know, what kept the average Russian peasant and the average Russian soldier going during the war? There was no prospect for democracy or prosperity or individual freedom. Why did they, what kept them, what kept them going? Well, yeah, survival definitely is one aspect. And many people had family that had suffered during the occupation. Uh, and any country that's invaded, I think, bands together against the external enemy. But there was actually a sense during the war that things were going to get better because there was a slight ease in censorship. There was uh, less talk about the party and more talk about the country. And people believed that actually after the war that there would be more democracy in Russia. So there was a certain hope during the war that they were fighting to gain those freedoms that, that they had during the war to some extent that would last. Now, I mean, things were still very you know, dictatorial during the war. You could get eight to 10 years for stealing an ear of corn. But everyone recognized that that was a terrible crime at a time when the army needed to be fed. So they made allowances for the system and, and they still had hope at that point about the future. We have one here on the right. Thank you so much. I have a question for Dr. Lachin. Um, we had substantial rationing in the United States during the war, and uh, in fact, I still have my ration book, so it's a souvenir to keep. But um, how well did rationing work? How much of a black market did we have? Uh, was there this enormous patriotism and moral suasion that led to higher behavior as opposed to um, lesser behavior on the home front? Not where black market was concerned. There was a lot of black market, and uh, obviously a lot of people evaded it. And I'm not sure why. You know, some people say, well, it's because of bureaucratic uh, bungling. Uh, but uh, again, I would quote uh, Collingham's book to you. And she argues persuasively that Americans did not suffer very much from privation of food. And she stressed the black market too. One of the reasons they didn't was because of the black market. But still, 
have to remember there are a lot of people living on the land then, <clears throat> uh, and the farmers, you know, that they, they didn't come close to suffering. They, they grew their own, as did lots of small town people who lived in towns that were spatially uh, copious. There's a lot of land, and so they, they uh, grew things. So one way or another, I don't think Americans suffered very much in terms of food. Now, the rest of it, yes, they, they couldn't get electronics, they couldn't get radios. There are a lot of things that, that uh, the war shut out. They couldn't get automobiles, obviously. Uh, and in some places, they needed automobiles to get to work, despite what I said before, you know, especially in the early part of the war. You know, a lot more people commuted by cars then, so that was something that, that uh, was rationed and luxuries were. Uh, but I don't think we suffered very much. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to get up here uh, with Dr. Pennington and uh, ha hear her tell about how much the Russians suffered, although I knew a lot of it before that, but we didn't come close to that. And I'm not putting us down because of that. I mean, we couldn't help it. We were prosperous and industrialized and hardworking and uh, had a lot of uh, virtues along with some uh, failings. Question in the center aisle. Yes, that, that's a, a lead-in to my question to Dr. Pennington. Uh, when I heard you speak about one death in America to 85 deaths in the Soviet Union or Russia, I, I had not heard that direct comparison before. And my question is, why the ignorance in America about the Russian contribution to the defeat of Germany uh, and maybe it's just my ignorance, but you know, we read and hear about D-Day and the importance of this, and it certainly was very important. But nowhere in my academic study do I see the facts that you presented as clearly as you did. Is it because of lack of academic rigor in Russia, or is it something deliberate on the part of our country? I think every country studies its own history first and understandably wants to know about its own achievements and its own actions in wartime. Add to that the Cold War environment immediately after World War II, our distrust of the Soviets and communism, our discounting of much of what they wrote at the time uh, as propaganda. It's only in the 90s when we really got into the archives and could begin confirming some of the information that really good scholarly work was done on a lot of this. And I think by then, attitudes were ingrained. Um, there, there's some really interesting literature, and, and I know Rob Satino can tell us about this, about how German generals have influenced our understanding of the war and of the Soviets in general. The, the generals that we brought over to, to talk about the war, to write their memoirs, uh, to teach us how to fight the communists. And so there's, there are varied reasons, I think, why we don't know much about what happened on the Eastern Front, and what we do know is, is very slanted. But that's one reason I became a teacher. One other point to add might be that, keep in mind, before the war, Americans would be suspicious of the Soviets because they were allied to Nazi Germany, 1939 to 1941. We have another question here on your right. Yes, uh, this question's for uh, Dr. Pennington. Uh, could you tell us? If I was the administration of, of uh, criminal justice in the Soviet Union, how did that proceed when you had people who were subjected to serious crimes for, for really uh, serious sentences for small crimes? But yeah, we have stories that you know, Stalin would empty the gulags to you know, put together these shock armies that came behind frontline troops as they were suffering such massive losses. How did they go about tempering the two where you did have people being punished for crimes, but yet they needed the bodies? Yeah, that was a, a constant problem. So they would have uh, trials and hearings because they wanted to make examples out of people. Some of the people would go into penal battalions, as you mentioned. Uh, other times, sentences were suspended. There, there were varying ways that they tried to deal with it. They didn't want to let people just get away with stealing things, but at the same time, they did need their bodies in the factories and in the army. So yeah, they did try to balance that. Do our last question here. Why did Stalin rely upon Hitler to honor the non-aggression pact? Oh, he, he never relied on Hitler to honor the non-aggression pact. Uh, Stalin wasn't quite that dumb. St 
Stalin had his failings, but unlike many Americans, Stalin had read Mein Kampf. He had underlined the passages about the ambitions that Hitler had in the East. He knew what was coming. It was just a matter of when. And he went into that pact hoping to buy time. He knew that the Soviet Union was not in any condition to deal with the German invasion in the 1930s, and he really thought that the Germans would get bogged down in the West much longer than they did. It took them a long time in the First World War to deal with things in France. So perhaps understandably, he thought that by leaving France alone that they could still tie down the Germans and he would get several more years before the Germans came his way. We have one more question here in the front row. I believe uh, Governor Romer brought up an extremely important point, indicating a deficiency in the educational system in this country. There was a time when many of us went through Air Force ROTC, where we were required to take two full years of geopolitics. Marvelous subject, very helpful, and I would hope all the educators in this room would reconsider as you formulate programs to introduce a strong geopolitic content to higher education. Thank you, buddy. I'd like to say thank you to Drs. Lachin and Pennington for shining a light on what it took for uh, both of these Titan nations to support and conduct a total war this afternoon. Uh, we will see you next door for a break and a book signing, and please come back for 4.30, 4.30 for our final panel of the afternoon.